Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jackie Gifford. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure. We are the world's leading travel media brand reaching some 30 million people across our print, digital, and social channels. Right now, the travel and tourism industry is facing serious headwinds due to the global pandemic. I wanna share some numbers with you that are incredibly sobering. A worst case scenario for our industry in 2020 would see $5.5 trillion lost in GDP, along with almost 200 million jobs. This is a critical time, I believe, for us to be thinking about the future. Specifically, how can the travel and tourism industry take this opportunity to prioritize sustainability and what role should consumers play? So joining me today, I have uh, several esteemed panelists and, in, panelists and industry leaders. We have Evelina Weaver Cruz, the Prime Minister of Aruba, joining us from Aruba. Rizwana Bashir, the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Peak.com, joining us from New York. We have Martin Yernekian, the CEO of Corporacion America, joining us from, uh, from uh, Uruguay. And then we have Greg Trinish, the Executive Director of Adventure Scientists, and he's joining us from out west in Montana. He, and both, I should add, both Greg and Roswana are young global leaders, which is part of a program with the World Economic Forum. So before we get started, I have a question to ask the audience, which you can answer on Slido. And I'll read the results in 30 seconds. So how do you expect your personal travel plans to change after the COVID-19 crisis? A, a lot. I plan to only stay local or change my habits significantly. B, quite a bit. I might still travel internationally, but I might slow it down. C, I can't wait to get back to my old travel habits. And then D, I'm not sure yet. So please share your responses and then I will uh, read, read that in a little bit. And then I just want to remind all the attendees that you can ask questions via Slido. I will be um, moderating the discussion. And then at the end, uh, I will direct the questions to your questions to our panelists. Okay, things are changing a little bit still. We'll give it another few seconds as people answer. This is fascinating to see. Okay, I think we've got, it changed again. I love watching this in real time. j'aime bien. All right, things are still shifting, but I, I wanna make sure we can get to our panelists. So it looks like as of right now, um, the, the answer that, that came out ahead is that people's travel plans are gonna change quite a bit. They might still travel internationally, but it, it's gonna slow down. But then that was at the 46%, but then right behind it, we also have, I can't wait to get back to my old travel habits at 40%, which I actually believe is quite encouraging. So to kick things off, I want to um, speak with the prime minister in Aruba. Thank you again so much for joining us. Can you please give the audience an overview of, of what's going on in Aruba right now, both from a public health standpoint, an economic standpoint, and also from a travel and tourism standpoint? Well, thank you. And first of all, um, greetings from Aruba, the one happy island. Thank you for this unique opportunity addressing matters that are very important to us. As you know, Aruba has an economy that is highly tourism driven. 80% of our GDP is directly or indirectly linked to tourism. So the COVID crisis hit us hard, not only on public health, but also socioeconomically. We closed our borders for the first time in Aruban history. We did this in March. So we could address the spreading of the virus on the island and to create a safe environment for our tourism uh, tourists or visitors to come back. 
During the lockdown, we developed an actionable plan for economic recovery and innovation. We called it repositioning our sales. We are now finalizing this master plan. It is a three-year plan that seeks economic growth uh, that is smart, that is inclusive, is sustainable, and it focuses on the structural and innovative reforms so we can become a resilient country with a resilient economy. Tourism will remain Aruba's most important economic pillar, but we need to, to diversify the industry in terms of job creation in Aruba. So we are thinking about uh, labor reform, tax reforms, digitalization of services. And our ambitions are not only geared towards bouncing back, but more importantly, bouncing forward with accelerated innovation capabilities. Prior to the reopening of our borders this summer, we launched an Aruba Health and Happiness Code. This requires businesses to adhere to mandatory hygiene and health protocols so we can protect our visitors and our residents. We also offer rapid testing at the airport and health screenings to maximize the safety. And I can tell you that since reopening of the borders this summer, we have very few cases of COVID among tourists. As a matter of fact, only 0.1%. And we believe this is partly due to the thorough approach that uh, we have in place for preventive um, safeguards in Aruba. The tourists are very happy to be visiting uh, Aruba, both the first timers as our repeat guests. Um, we are not done yet combating the COVID crisis in Aruba. We are still fighting to stop the spreading um, and at the same time to create the environment to address the unemployment. That is a real issue in Aruba. But we feel that we have been successful up until now in fighting the spreading. Um, of the virus while at the same time reopening Aruba for the tourists um, uh, to come back. And our motto is Aruba is open for happiness and that is what we strive for. What are travelers asking for now? I mean, they're having to think about all these things in terms of healthcare, public health, safety, social distancing that they've never thought of before. So what are you seeing? What, are, what is the priority really for visitors at this moment? Well, as you mentioned, uh, travelers are very concerned about safety and health measures, but they're also looking for greater flexibility. Flexibility from the airlines, from the hotels and other tourism businesses, um, given the uncertainty that people feel when they start making their plans. Um, they also want more communication and information. And even though not all information is available, um, they want to feel like the destinations are doing their best to keep the travelers informed and to keep them safe. And I can mention that most of our hotels in Aruba are offering, offering a flexible cancellation or postponement um, in booking, uh, or postponement options in bookings. We also launched an happily ever after guarantee. Uh, this is the first postponable booking policy for any couple looking to book a wedding or a honeymoon in Aruba in 2021. Um, we have also noticed that working from home is on the rise. So we introduced our one happy workation. And this program offers the option to work in paradise for up to three months and uh, also offer longer deals, uh, deals for longer stays. Um, this is a trend that we are seeing in Aruba as more, more, more tourists are extending their trips. Statistics show Americans want to travel. Many haven't traveled all year, especially not abroad, and are feeling like stuck at home. Travel can also help with the well-being. So many travelers are seeking out beach destinations and secluded experiences and making the pro proximity of Aruba and our unique location a compelling escape. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to quickly turn to Martin. So Martin, Corporación America is the largest private sector airport concession operator in the world with a huge footprint in Latin and South America, an area of the world that has sadly been hit hard by the virus. You are also one of the largest private sector airport operators in the world in terms of traffic. So can you share some statistics with us and, and where do airports go from here? Well, I, uh, I, I wouldn't talk only about the airports. I would talk about the, the whole um, aviation ecosystem, which has been hit really hard, which, and, and we lie within the, the tourism sector, right? Um, although we profit from 
uh, business travelers and, and, and other reasons for travel. Tourism is the number one reason for, for travel. And, and since, since March, we've seen, the, I don't need to repeat this, but this is the, the worst disruption uh, in the life of this industry since it became mainstream 50 years ago. And uh, even at the high season of August, we're seeing um, numbers down between 80 and 95, 98%, depending on, on, on the different uh, airports of the 52 we run between uh, South America, Italy, and Armenia. Um, and uh, the most worrying part of this is, is um, the fact that the industry, uh, six months into this, um, this tragedy, doesn't have a clear uh, um, consolidated approach on getting out of this. Um, I think the, the, the lack of leadership that, that uh, we see in, in other issues in the world, including sustainability, and the lack of, uh, of, of a mainstream or, or a com common view worldwide on how to approach this, it's, um, it's, it's overlapping, it's, it's overflowing into this industry where there is no, there's still not a common approach uh, within countries and, and, and regions of the world on, on what is needed for this industry to restart. Um, as a company and, and personally, we, uh, we work very hardly within the industry unions and, and trade groups. Uh, I'm a member of the board of, of ACI, the, the organization that uh, brings the airports together worldwide. And uh, our idea is that we need to have a common approach with governments and countries uh, that can assure the traveler uh, enough confidence to make a decision to start traveling. Because we have seen uh, airlines trying to uh, get back on their feet, start uh, scheduling flights, but we have not seen the response of the traveler. People are still afraid and they do not, what, they do not know what to expect. Each country has their own different rules even within unions such as the, uh, the EU, different countries have different rules and it's, it's very complicated for people to know what they need to do to travel. Um, we need to get that confidence back by having one global standard led by hopefully ICAO in, in this industry for aviation. Um, and the approach of the airports uh, as of today, I think airlines are in the same page is uh, uh, we need to find ways to bring technology into the equation to get confidence into the travelers that when they get into an airplane, all the people around them have been tested and they are negative. This is, uh, I think, the only tool that we see uh, really as a game changer for the industry in, in, in the meantime, until we have a vaccine, which Again, uh, uh, hopefully it'll be soon, yeah. but no one really knows how long it might take. Yeah, can you talk? I think people want to know what airport design is going to be like, what, what the actual process could be like going forward. Can you speak a little bit about that and how airports could potentially use this time when traffic is, is limited to rebuild, to rethink how, how travelers approach even getting in and then eventually boarding that plane. And, and to your point, it has to be somewhat of a unified response. Yeah, well, uh, the same way in, in other aspects of life, um, the trends that we saw coming before the pandemic, uh, and we also saw accelerating uh, during the pandemic, I think the same thing we will see uh, at the airports. Um, and in this case, uh, Aruba is a, is a great uh, example. Um, Aruba was one of the first countries in the world, uh, uh, along with Uruguay, where I'm, where I'm based uh, now, that started using biometric technology to do the full passenger flow since you get into the airport until you uh, get on the plane, uh, thus requiring you to touch less things, to, to, to interact less with, uh, with other people being able to give you the social distancing required for, for, for uh, uh, this pandemic. So I think we will see that accelerating really fast, the, the adoption of technologies in, in this matter, but we will also see all sorts of changes. We have adapted the airports the same as many airlines uh, in terms of uh, cleaning protocols, the availability 
uh, of, of uh, cleaning materials for passengers. We have run a survey and we, um, we realized that uh, the passenger profile has changed quite a bit. And we have found that around 30% of our passengers, they are not happy with us telling them that we are sanitizing everything and changing protocols for them to be safe. They want to be able to do, to do that themselves. They want to have cleaning materials and wipes and things at hand at the airport to be able to wipe their surfaces around them and uh, get their space, uh, the, the confidence that they need. So we are doing these kind of things at the airport as well beyond uh, the distancing measures, the, the windows and, and, and the technology we're bringing in. Um, but I think all of this uh, is, is ancillary to the fact that as long as you know what to expect when you when you travel uh, happens, people will not have confidence. If you have to do a, a, a trip that, that has three legs and each leg has a different requirement, 14 days quarantine, seven days quarantine, uh, or no quarantine, testing or no testing, uh, this is very complex for passengers. Um, yeah. This is what needs to be addressed, I think, for the industry to be able to restart. Yeah. Just one last question very quickly. How many people do you employ worldwide? So how many people are within the corporate and America umbrella? So directly in the 52 yeah. airports, there are 6,000 employees. But okay. only th if you think of only one airport uh, in Argentina, the, the busiest international airport in Argentina, that airport, in that airport, we employ around, around uh, 700 people. But the ecosystem at the airport is around 25,000 direct employees. And then you have the, all the indirect that, that are coming from the outside to, to bring services in. So the industry, we all know that employs uh, um, a big part of, of, of the world's population and GDP. So restart is a must. Yeah, thank you. Rizwana, we've known each other for many years, uh, and actually you're one of the, the last people I saw in person here in New York. Uh, You've been a dear friend. Uh, you and Peak, you've built a business around connecting travelers with local providers, and many of the experiences on your platform are affordable. Things like a Brooklyn Bridge running tour of New York for forty dollars. So, how will destinations and travel providers market themselves differently now? Is sustainability going to be a part of that message? And what do travel providers need to be thinking about? I think um, COVID safety is, is a really important aspect. Um, now, I think one of the things that we're seeing is when um, consumers are coming, they want to know that there's a contactless guest experience, um, that I can sign a waiver um, digitally, I don't have to do anything physically, um, that there are limitations on the number of people that are coming to things. I think we're now in an era where knowing that there are extremely small groups matters to people, um, and even being able to do something privately. Um, and so having more flexibility and optionality around that. So I think as a marketer, you know, some of the things that you might be celebrating now about what you're doing might be around, well, this is in nature. Um, this is something that's a small experience that you might be able to have on your own. Um, and I think, frankly, what we're seeing is there's a big push towards local. Um, and so even, you know, on our platform, you know, obviously when, when COVID originally happened, um, you know, no one was going outside, bookings were down. Um, but actually we've seen bookings really come up and in certain areas, they have really, um, you know, rocketed. So things like kayaking or renting a boat or, or a bike, those have been up almost 400% over the summer. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing is that, you know, local bookings have doubled. Um, so people are staying closer to home. So I think if you're a marketer, um, especially in the US, you're kind of looking to say, Go and stay in your local market, you know, have a staycation, find fun things to do locally. And this is a safe way to get into nature. So I think sustainability, I think, as you look at it on a big picture level, I do think you'll be seeing people traveling abroad less over the next year. And as they're doing that, they're going to be staying close at home. But as they are staying close at home, I think they're looking for things that allow them to get it outdoors and into nature um, in small groups. And I think that's where there is a potential risk on sustainability, because we need to make sure that we're protecting these local regions as well. Yeah. Are there, can you share what destinations in the United States seem to be trending the most on, on your site? What we're seeing is that it's around these secondary or tertiary areas that are close to big cities. So as an example, Long Beach in Los Angeles, bookings there are up 300%. 
Um, so what we're seeing is that people kind of want to stay close to home. They want to drive within about 100 to 200 miles away. Um, and they're looking for things that allow them to get on the water or outside. And so anything that might be nature orientated or, or allows you to get um, into the coasts, that's working very well. And people are actually willing to drive even further. We're seeing that people's desire for flying is still lower or has been. Um, I think that may change over the coming months, um, you know, especially since we're talking about all the uh, the rapid you know, COVID testing that could that could emerge. But really we're seeing, you know, big leaps in small areas like Long Beach or, or areas in Florida where people are able to go and, uh, and get outside and, and, and are actually able to do something that um, allows them to drive. Um, and we're seeing a huge kind of um, peak in demand around anything water or nature related. How then, I think the beauty of travel is also that human connection, right? That's why we travel is to meet new people. So how do we preserve that in this socially distanced world? Because for, you know, I, part of the beauty of New York City, which is my hometown, is is the, pe the people that live here make up New York City. And I don't, as a traveler, necessarily want to go somewhere and always be, uh, you know, just divorced from the place. So how do some of your providers make that make a, a meaningful connection with, well, with travelers actually, in this new era. The idea of having a guide or a walking tour or something like that becomes more important, right? Because you are going to have less of those random occurrences. So how is it that you might be able to connect with locals who really have been living there for 30 or 40 years, have great experience? So we have taught walking tours of Soho in New York, and we're going to be able to show you these nooks and crannies. So I do think probably as a, you know, as you're coming in um, as a visitor, it becomes more important to find ways to connect with locals, to have dining experiences that incorporate locals or off the beaten track, track areas. And so I think that that is, um, you know, I think it is a challenge. And I think it's an area where I think actually, frankly, local providers are doing a really good job. And we see that where they're beginning to have smaller tours and they're ensuring that guides can share some of that character and that local flair. And so I think that's, I think, something that we're going to see more of is that people who might normally say, hey, I'm going to go around the city on my own and now saying, actually, I'd love to have somebody who can help guide me through that, um, where I am able to perhaps go to some restaurants that are still open, that are, you know, areas that feel safe. Um, so I think that guidance is becoming more important. Yeah, personal expertise still matters. Expertise still matters for travelers. Indeed. They want, they need it now more than ever before. I'm going to move over to Greg. Uh, Adventure Scientists is a very amazing nonprofit. So individuals can actually volunteer to collect data at your various locations to protect species and ecosystems. So for example, just for the audience, your Montana project looks at the impact motor vehicles have on wildlife. And so adventure scientists volunteers will actually cycle 11, 000, over 11,000 miles of Montana's roads recording all the wildlife and roadkill tragically that they encounter as well as detailed environmental observations. They then feed that back to you uh, I think this is an amazing project. So before COVID, I would say that sustainable tourism and over tourism really focused a lot of the times on cities, uh, on places like Venice, Barcelona. But, but we actually right now need to be thinking about our natural spaces too. As we've all heard, there's a rush to get to some of these natural spaces right now. So what, what are you seeing, Greg? And, and can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, well, so the tourism in these natural places is has been climbing for years. This year in Yellowstone National Park, there was this this August, we had a seven and a half percent increase from last year. Uh, and it's the second highest level of visitation in Yellowstone ever. Uh, it's 2017 was the, the previous record, which was for the eclipse. Uh, and so these places definitely are being flocked to, and it's been happening for quite a long time. I used to, before I started Adventure Scientists, I used to guide trips out uh, all over the, the country to our national parks and uh, a place called Desolation National uh, Monument, or I guess Desolation Wilderness, rather, outside of Lake Tahoe. And the overcrowding there and, and visitation that we saw in places like that over a decade ago was problematic. You couldn't get campsites. The campsites were, were becoming littered with toilet paper uh, and trash in those places. Uh, and it's, it's a huge, huge issue. Um, 
it is pushing people who have traditionally gone to these places more remote into the wilderness, um, getting people uh, to go out even further. The challenge that we're facing, at least here in the US, and I know this is true uh, across uh, South America and in Central Africa as well, is, is fires are adding to this challenge too. And so you've got this combined uh, challenge of, of climate change and the fact that conditions on the ground are dangerous for a number of reasons, uh, in addition to COVID. Um, you know, biggest challenges with COVID are looking at traveling through the small towns as you get to these places. I think people need to be super mindful of, of coming from cities and moving across uh, small towns in Montana where I live or, or elsewhere um, and bringing the potential of bringing COVID with them to these towns that maybe haven't seen outbreak levels just yet. Yeah. Is this the moment that you see voluntourism actually take off? We've talked about voluntourism for a long time in the travel industry, and I'm not, I, I'm not entirely convinced that it's as popular as people wanted it to be. But I actually, I actually believe maybe this is the moment it does become something that people believe in. Yeah, I mean, I, I started this organization uh, almost a decade ago now when after a year of ex uh, a career of exploration and traveling around the world, I actually walked the length of South America uh, and, and had these adventures where the purpose of them was the adventure. The purpose of them was simply going to these places. And I just started to feel extremely selfish. I started to feel like going to these places for my own benefit without thinking about the uh, local people that were there without thinking about the environment that I was traveling through uh, and how to do something positive for those areas was really problematic for me. And so I started the organization believing that, like myself, there were tens of thousands of people uh, who go outside every single day, whether they're climbing or biking or kayaking, uh, and that they, if given simple tools and ways to make a difference, will choose to do that. Uh, we've had uh, tens of thousands of volunteers work through adventure scientists and do that. And we see that in other uh, voluntourism groups as well. There, there are uh, so many people who hope that there is a way for them to actually make a positive difference. And that's one of the biggest challenges is distinguishing between, you know, if you're paying uh, a fee to go and do this, or if you are uh, in these areas, how can you be sure that, that it really matters? How can you be sure that the, the work that you're doing isn't just benefiting some corporation or NGO or that that money actually gets back to the purpose that it was intended for? Uh, and I think that it's a responsibility of people who travel to look at the issues facing the areas that they're visiting um, to get a more holistic picture than maybe just sitting on the beach or maybe just looking at um, these very isolated tourist destinations or tourist areas that you go to in these places. And to think about how you could really make a difference while you're out there. Um, you know, our organization has a limited number of offerings where uh, it takes us years to develop these projects and build these projects so that we can be sure impact is at the center. And so if somebody's gonna go and volunteer for say our uh, timber projects where they're traveling from uh, anywhere from Mexico to Alaska uh, and they can go and, and take samples from very specific species of trees, those samples are then being fed to prosecutors who are using it to combat illegal timber harvest. So a, a hiker, a boater, somebody who can just get into a remote area can go and, and take a tree core and then that tree core gets fed to law enforcement uh, where they have it in a database and can compare it to what's suspected to be illegal timber harvests. And so that's a great example of a project we built that uh, has lasting impact and will absolutely uh, benefit these places that, that people are traveling to. And there's so many other great groups that are, that are doing things that truly benefit the people and truly benefit the environment in those places. And, and people have to see it. Thank you, Greg. I'm going to ask you one quick question. So just to remind the audience, you can you can ask us questions on Slido. I have I'm going to turn to the Q and A portion. And the first question I think is great for you, Greg. For those that want to get out to nature but aren't that experienced, what sort of things should they think about to ensure that they don't have a negative impact? Yeah, 
Uh, great question. I think, um, you know, working with a group like peak.com and finding a local guide that is going to uh, make sure that their participants, almost always those guides care deeply about the places that they're guiding in. And so going with a local guide is certainly an option. There's a great group called Leave No Trace. Um, so anybody who doesn't know that can visit Leave No Trace and, and look at the ethics of wilderness travel. I mean, a lot of it is common sense too. Uh, if you are leaving anything but footprints, then you're probably doing more than you should. Uh, making sure that you are following uh, those leave no trace ethics and, and also just being a good citizen. It's the same thing you would do when you visit a city. If it's, you know, Copiapo uh, or, or wherever it is in, in South America, you wanna make sure that you represent wherever country you're from well. You wanna make sure that you're uh, leaving um, good memories for people. And, and so you try to just be a good citizen and the same thing is true in the wilderness. Yeah, and I'll direct another question from the audience to the prime minister. Thank you, Greg. What is Aruba's policy on quarantine for arriving visitors? Current, currently, we have um, the, the policy in place is that there is no quarantine for tourists traveling to Aruba, with the exception of the quarantine needed in order to wait for the test results. Um, we have defined some states um, and, and countries that need to do the testing before coming to Aruba and can only board if they have a negative test. Um, that those are the, the um, areas that are most affected. Um, areas that are not that affected can come to the island and then they will do the test here in Aruba and then have to keep in quarantine until they receive the result of the test. The results are in within 24 hours. At this moment, we are in an average of eight hours. So when a tourist arrives within eight hours, maximum 24 hours, he or she will receive its test results. We have an app, we have developed an Aruba Health app that they are able to upload once they arrive, and then they will receive the test results uh, on that app, um, mostly around eight hours, and, and then um, they're free, free to explore the island. Thank you. Martin, I'm gonna direct this question to you because I think it's very interesting when we think about the ecosystem of an airport. How can people be more informed as to where their tourism dollars go? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, uh, I think that for that, what, what uh, Peak and, and, and Greg do, uh, do a lot, but um, if, 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 if you have to think of, of sustainability, that there are issues in, in, in mass tourism that uh, can only be addressed with uh, worldwide agreed policies. Um, mm -hmm. There is no way to offset or to lower the carbon footprint of the industry, for example, without uh, a real worldwide policy. And um, if we, if, if this pandemic has taught us a lesson, a lesson is that, uh, Things that happen in one part of the world affect the whole world because we are all very much interconnected. And, and this is as valid for health as for the health of the planet. So uh, beyond what you spend on, if you, if you spend on an airline that has a bigger uh, carbon footprint than the next airline, which, which those things happen. And, and I think travelers should be very much aware on for example, if they go to a destination, how green is that, that, that destination? Um, at airports, we are we're working towards uh, um, getting consensus for uh, uh, neutral emission targets. Um, and, and, and as an organization for airports, we're working our way to getting that consensus. It's, it's not easy because members countries as industries uh, but the industries are working their way into that uh, the same thing with many many airlines and uh, you can do your research and find out how these airports uh, look like we we are installing um, um, solar panels at, at our airports uh, we are taking care of our waste and our water waste um, we have one of the airports in our network is in the Galapagos Islands this is the first 
uh, carbon neutral airport in the world. And, um, and, and, and it's one that has all the protocols in place um, to leave uh, the, the smallest footprints, not only in, in terms of carbon, which is probably the, the one that everybody concerns the most, but in, in everything else that we do at the airport, we do it with a conscience not to uh, leave a mark on the environment because this is a, this is a place that needs to uh, be safeguarded. But uh, this is a very small place and, and a very special place. This idea has to spill over to the rest of the world and the travel industry, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna just ask some final questions for our panel. Um, I'm gonna move over to, to the prime minister again. So as, as we look to rebuild, how are, how are you in Aruba going to prioritize job creation, attracting tourists back, but also sustainability? We, we want to make sure that sustainability is not divorced from the economic priorities. I'm already seeing, you know, plastic consumption go up a tremendous amount here um, in, in New York and in the United States. So, so what are some of the green policies you have in Aruba and what do you want to do going forward? Um, well, during the, the past few years, we have already worked hard to put in place a wide array of um, sustainability uh, initiatives. And we're fortunate that we can more easily maintain some of these initiatives because of that past work that we've done. But still, it's very important not to lose sight of these priorities. Um, currently, we continue to look at how to adapt to the conditions um, in the wake of COVID while also advancing our sustainability efforts. Um, on combating the effects on the environment and climate change, a top priority remains um, that we should do everything we can in order um, to, to support uh, these priorities. Our energy is already 10% sustainable with production of wind and solar energy. Um, we have already banned all single-use plastic bags in 2017, and as of this year, um, this ban expanded also to the use of uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, including uh, the plastics and including styrofoam. So in, in protection of the marine um, environment, but we also passed legislation designating a marine park. And in further protection of the marine life, we have also banned oxybenzone since uh, last year. This is a chemical found in many sunscreens that can harm the corals. Uh, in 2018, the ex-expedition announced that they would host a 300 guest crew of women from different backgrounds and skill sets to sail around the world. Aruba participated, and by gaining the expert skill and knowledge uh, on the sampling, the collecting, the analyzing of the plastics in the ocean and on land, we have the opportunity to become a world leader in understanding the effects of plastic on our environment and our economy. Um, we also launched an Aruba Promise uh, in 19. This is a voluntary digital pledge where visitors can sign that they acknowledge their responsibility and commitment to help preserve this island for generations to come. So those are some of the initiatives, but in the, the most important part is not to lose sight of the commitment towards sustainability, even though we are combating this COVID crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rizwana, I want to move it back to you. You work with so many small businesses on peak. And right now, the challenges for many small businesses are, are dire. They're having to adapt. Uh, they're facing ever-changing state and local guidelines as to what they can do. How, how can they sustain themselves? How are they looking for opportunities elsewhere? And, and then also, how can they use technology to maybe look to the future? Yes, I think um, technology has been a really important aspect of, of what the businesses are doing. The type of businesses um, that we work with are pretty small. They provide zip lining or, or a walking tour and, um, and technology wasn't a big part of what they did. And so a lot of what we've been providing them with is online bookings and payments for their own website um, through our Peak Pro technology and um, a lot of things on site that allow you to do everything in advance. And I think what we're seeing is that um, advanced booking 
And inventory management and, and kind of people management is a really big piece now. Um, as we're getting into a new world, I think that those limitations on groups and being able to manage that really well and ensure that people can book in advance or when they arrive, they're not having to um, line up, be close to lots of people. So there's some really basic things around technology where we can solve those problems. We can help people do everything electronically. Um, but I think you know, with that, I think it's giving um, these businesses new opportunities that didn't exist before as well, which is thinking about their local opportunities. I think in Aruba, it might be a little bit more challenging, but I think in in a lot of the US, um, in, in other markets, what you can see is that these businesses can think about how they can serve um, locals better, right? And that might be a very different tour. It might not be as much uh, focused on on, on, on on spots that are, that are um, big attractions. It might actually be about local north no neighborhood haunts. Um, we're also seeing that, you know, with a lot of the things that are happening with virtual schooling, there's a demand for kids to have something to do after school, right? And so we're seeing businesses that are leaning into that and saying, okay, well, you can go kayaking in the evening to see bioluminescent kind of areas in, in your in your um, in your own um, uh, you know town or area. You might be able to do bike tours and things like that. And so I do think there's. There's growing need um, from consumers that's changing alongside a whole swathe of virtual experiences that are, that are beginning. Um, and I think those virtual experiences will eventually become a mix of in-person and virtual, but there's a whole emergence of, you know, you can do a cooking class with somebody who's in Morocco um, from, from your home here and learn about Moroccan cooking. So I think there is gonna be a lot of, of opportunity that comes out of this um, and the lean into local um, and lean into using technology has been the two biggest things that we've seen um, for the businesses that have actually been able to thrive during this period. Um, and I hope that that can continue. I think the winter is gonna be challenging. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Greg, quickly talk to me about greenwashing. How can consumers go beyond a company's message to really verify that the work is being done? I think you're on mute. Greg, sorry. Yeah, it's a great question. And it happens all the time, especially in the tourism industry. I think, you know, it's what I spoke to before. You've, you've got to uh, understand what the company is selling you. And if it's some big lofty goal of we're going to save the world through this, you know, one tour to Aruba, that's probably not going to be uh, something that is worth following through with. Um, it's something that's probably going to be greenwashed, I think. So looking for the realistic component of what's in there, making sure you understand the theory of change. And so working backwards from if our goal is to have a positive effect on climate or reduce carbon emissions, even when you're buying your carbon offsets, asking questions about where those go, uh, who you're actually paying for that money, that is so, with that money, that is so important. And thinking about uh, actually just going one step further. In most cases, you can just Google a little bit more about these issues and learn uh, much more than you ever thought was possible. Uh, and so I, I just think it is on travelers, it is on people to make sure that the companies that they're working with have been certified, that they're following uh, metrics and, and being recognized by places like Travel and Leisure as sustainable uh, tourism companies generally if you don't have time or energy to do that homework, then uh, these companies like National Geographic and Travel and Leisure and others uh, certainly uh, are doing that homework. Well, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to the audience for tuning in today, our panelists joining us from all over the world. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. If you'd like to learn more about the work being done on sustainable tourism at the World Economic Forum, go to the forum's website. You can see the link, it's posted in the chat. I'm Jackie Gifford, the editor-in-chief of Travel and Leisure. Again, thank you, and I hope to see you in person soon. <laughs>